to Conversations with Writers. I'm Andy, I'm a poet and a writing instructor in higher education. This is an educational series meant to catalog writing philosophies and strategies through conversation with other writers. Shar McCallum is from Jamaica and the author of six books published in the US and the UK, including No Ruined Stone, forthcoming in late summer 2021. No Ruined Stone is a verse sequence based on an alternate account of history and Scottish poet Robert Burns's near migration to Jamaica to work on a slave plantation. McCallum's previous award-winning collection, Mad Woman, received the 2018 OCM Bocas Prize for Caribbean Poetry and the 2018 Martin Book Prize from the New England Poetry Club. Her poems and essays have appeared in numerous journals, anthologies, and textbooks throughout the US, Caribbean, Latin America, Europe, and Israel, and have been translated into several languages, including Spanish, Italian, French, Romanian, Dutch, and Turkish. La Historia es un Corto, History is a Room, an anthology of poems selected from across her six books and translated and introduced by Albert Salas Hernandez, will be published in 2021 by Mantis Editores in Mexico. McCallum regularly delivers readings, lectures, and workshops at universities and literary festivals in the US and internationally. She is a liberal arts professor of English at Penn State University and on the faculty of Pacific University Low Residency MFA program. And this is my conversation with Shara. So what are you working on now? Right at this moment, um, I finished a long poem that was part of a, a project that was um, commissioned by a composer who's been also commissioned to write a piece for the Biennale in Venice in September. So um, I finished that at the end of 2020. I worked with her on that. There are three other poets. Um, her work is amazing. She works with, I've worked with her before, but never creating something. Um, and she works with poets who are going to be part of the composition. So the voice of the poet reading the poem, as well as singers and other kinds of musical, um, you know, instruments you would normally associate with classical music all come together. Anyway, so that was the most recent thing I finished. Um, I guess in terms of books, maybe you're asking about coming out. Um, I worked for the past five years on a book that's coming out in August in the US and UK called No Ruined Stone. And it's a book about the, um, well, it's a book of poems, but it tells a story across the book. Um, in that sense, it's a novel in verse. And it investigates a question, which is um, coming out of a story I learned about the 18th century Scottish poet Robert Burns, who almost went to Jamaica to work on a slave plantation. Um, this did not really match up with my image of Burns that I had derived in my 20s, reading his poems as a lover of romantic poetry. Uh, I remain a lover of the poetry and Burns poems, but I wanted to kind of try to understand, um, you know, what would have happened had he gone. Um, and so the poems tell that story narratively, but really investigating the question of history and the life of an individual, what are the choices that we make um, when we're faced with um, competing beliefs? And in that sense, I think it's probably a book about the 18th century that continues to reverberate into the present. Um, certainly it's a book about slavery. It's a book about passing. It's a book about the untold history of Jamaica vis-a-vis -vis the Scottish presence in Jamaica. We often think of the English presence there, but in fact, the Scottish presence was um, just as numerous in the foundation um, in this kind of, you know, tectonic meeting of Africa and the Americas and Europe. That is the country of my birth. And is that what motivated the project, this question of if he had gone? So I think that was the question that first popped into my mind. and. Um, it's a really interesting, more narrative question than I usually pursue as a poet. I think I've joked many times it's rightfully the territory of a novelist to ask that kind of a question. 
But um, being a poet, I, I absolutely wanted poems to be able to do the work of responding to that. But I really think then the larger thematic or emotional ideational questions that this book was driven by are ones that I've pursued probably the course of my life, um, really, honestly, as a writer. Um, and they really do have to do with um, migration, memory, race, identity, loss, absent fathers, absent countries, you know, um, so absent mothers, parents, the countries are absent and so much of the books I've written. Um, so this book is not about me. And I, and I, you know, I wrote um, an author's note that is at the back of the poems, which I usually never do. But it's an essay about the journey of this book. So, you know, it, it gets at some of these questions you're asking, Andy, and they're, they're really great questions. Um, what makes you as a writer pursue these subjects? And I think for me, it's that they're already in me. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so what did you learn about yourself through writing about hmm. a dead Scottish white guy from, I want to say these, the 1700s? Correct. Yeah. What did I learn about myself? Well, the first thing, you know, I learned is that um, I suppose that was incredibly challenging to write in his voice. So I'm going to tackle this first as a as a writer and handle the craft question. I think probably people are more interested in the ethical and political answer to this question, but I'm gonna start with the craft answer, which is that I didn't know how to reconstruct his voice in any way that felt like I could really do it justice in a literary sense. Um, so I did an incredible amount of research. I spent a lot of time in Scotland listening to Scots. I reread all of his poems, his prose, I went to the archives and looked at his letters, his journals. I really wanted to imbibe his voice so that I could then reproduce it. And that is um, an answer that's a writing answer. Um, what it took for me to feel as if I could do that. The ethical and political answer is a longer one, but I think that um, the second half of this book that wasn't what I expected to write is part of the answer to that. There's another character who speaks. These are primarily dramatic monologues, this book. And this first half is in Burns' voice primarily. This, though there is a poem that I could come back to, which is in the voice of the slave owner. Burns was not a slave owner. What he was was an overseer. So he was of the class of Scots who would have gone to Jamaica and um, had to oversee the work of enslaved Africans, but himself not have had the profits of slavery that the owners of the plantations had, and he would have most likely, as many Scots did, been trapped in that class position. So I wanted to really, you know, honor this um, history of Burns, not to either exonerate him or to condemn him, but to investigate what that looks like in, in creating his voice. But I think the big answer to it came out of the second character in this book who speaks, and it's Isabella. And she is his granddaughter who is um, speaking from the 19th century, right before slavery is going to end in, in the Caribbean and the West Indies, which is a good 30 years prior to when it ends in the United States, by the way. So 1833 versus 1865. Um, and she is speaking in that period right before when, where nobody, there's huge amounts of abolitionism going on in Scotland, but nobody knows when this is going to finally People are going to say enough is enough. We're not going to create, continue to create this um, morally reprehensible, but incredibly lucrative for the for the colonizer, you know, system of commerce that in that reduces human beings to nothing except for a product in a capitalist economy. So that's the milieu into which Isabella speaks. However, she is the granddaughter of the slave owner and Burns' daughter with an enslaved African woman. Can you pause, process that genealogy or maybe I need to repeat it? Burns has a relationship with an enslaved African woman. Their child is raped by the owner of the plantation. And Isabella is the product of that. And she looks white and she passes for white. She goes to Scotland and passes for white. 
So that's another answer to your question of um, the kind of what did I learn is that I needed another side. I needed her voice. Um, I needed a different vantage point because only trying to be true to the vantage point of Burns would have erased um, so much of the history that I am from. You know, it would have only given voice to the um, the the European man who is the you know either in enslaving Africans directly or indirectly participating in that. And I realized I couldn't write that book. Um, so I think she was who I heard first, ironically. And that wasn't what I expected when I asked that question, right? So I asked the question, what would have happened had he gone? But then, of course, immediately out of that, her grandmother is in my ear, who is an, Afri an enslaved African woman who comes to Jamaica as a child. She is in my ear. Her story, her Isabella's story, Isabella's mother's story, all these women are in my mind. And so I have to find then the, the way to write that that story, which is as much as anything, the real story of this book. It's about Burns, but it's really about his descendants who are denied that voice in history. That's wonderful. I'm really looking forward to this new book. Thank you. Um, and that's coming out, it's coming out in August, right, of 2021? Yeah, so the in the US it'll be out in August and then it'll be out just a little bit earlier, uh, end of July in the UK with a different press. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so when you're struggling to write, and this seems like this was a very challenging book to write, yeah. um, what strategies do you use to get to the page? So I think in this case, it's different than sometimes what I use, but um, in a way not. Um, I do a great deal of um, writing in notebooks where I don't have a sense of direction and I allow myself that kind of freedom. Uh, to write by ear, write by line, write by voice, and not so much worry about how I'm going to make it cohere in those drafts. And I did a lot of that. I filled notebooks. Um, the research that I did here is very unusual for me. It's not that books of poems I've written haven't been engaged with history, but they didn't require the kind of research and work in the archives that this book did. And so I'd say more typical to my process is to sit quietly with pen and paper and see what comes. <laughs> That's a not great very, strategy. Not very uh, illuminating of the writing process. This is why they don't make movies about writers. Where they, <laughs> do, they have to find other things because the activity of writing is basically being by yourself, sitting alone with your own mind. And um, that doesn't make for exciting film or discussions, really. So. <laughs> no, I thought it was a great answer. Um, so okay. why write? Uh, what keeps you generating material? That's an also excellent question. Um, I suppose I could answer that in many ways. I would say, why not write? Um, writing for me makes me feel more whole. Um, it makes me more grounded and centered. So that's one reason to write. Um, I love poetry. I love essays. So in a fact, in an attempt to write for me, an attempt to write is an attempt to apprentice myself to these arts and to see what I can do in them. Um, I love literature. I've always been a reader first before ever imagining being a writer. And so being a writer is to be wanting to contribute the voices and particularly of those women I talked about to add them to the body of literature, um, which I think still historically, even to this day, has made them exist um, secondarily. So, you know, across the course of the books that I'm writing, it's not that I'm not interested in exploring all of the truth I am, which includes the truth of those um, European men who are not only in my books, but in my ancestry, right? And so, I'm interested in looking at all of it, not looking away from any of it. However, the principal people I want to give voice to are those, those women who I hear loudest in my ear, who I'm from, and who don't often have still as yet many pages given to them. 
Amazing. Thanks. What about um, your favorite part of the writing, the writing process? So what's your favorite part of the writing process and why? So I remember when I met Richard Ford, who's a novelist, and it was when I was early on in you know, um, my time working, um, setting up readings at my first job. And I remember this because it stayed with me. Richard Ford was asked this question and he said, my favorite part is having written. <laughs> and um, I understood what he meant and I understand still what he means. I feel very grateful when I have been able, like it with no one ruined stone, this book, no ruined stone, which really challenged me um, on many levels, emotionally, intellectually, artistically, all of it, like the whole of it. I still think that my favorite part of the process remains the process. <laughs> so I agree with him, but then I also think, what do I really enjoy? It's the act of writing that I described, that being alone, that being able to center myself and be by myself. Um, I think, you know, so much of the work that you and I do as teachers, we're both poets, but we're also teachers of, you know, poetry and writing, is social. It's outward. The, the relationship between the text and you is that you are um, in the role of like giving it to others, enabling their receipts of it or encouraging their voices, all of which I love and I think is beautiful. However, it is the opposite for me of writing. And so what I love about writing is that it's the part of me that is, um, is much quieter on that process. So, yeah. Shout out to Richard Ford, though. I think people should hear many answers to these questions from different writers. Because what I'm really trying to illustrate by bringing Richard Ford into this conversation is that people have vastly different answers to these questions that you're asking. They're great questions, but you will get so many different answers and they're all the right answer. Awesome. Thank you. And what about revision strategies? What are some of your favorite revision strategies and why? Favorite revision strategies, starting the poem somewhere else, being merciless is my favorite. Reason. So as a way in, I am absolutely merciless in revision. As free as I am when I draft is the opposite when I go to revise a poem. Um, then I'm trying to great, gain distance from it to see what it might be, to re-see it from as many angles as possible. And so practically speaking, one of the ways to do that is to be un utterly unattached to what I have written. So I often will go through and underline what I think are the best words in the best order. Thank you, Coleridge, for the best definition of poetry. I love saying it. Best words, best order. I will go to where is the language the most striking in my ear. Um, and I'll rebuild the poem from there, you know, which means sometimes I've written a page and I'm going to keep two lines to restart, or I'll start the poem somewhere where it, it ends or somewhere else because it cannot unfold the same then. And so that's also teaching me how to gain that distance and to re-see it. Um, a particularly fun exercise, and these are all things I offer to students, you know, when I teach, but is the um, collage exercise. So this is another way to even be more radical. I do that activity of underlining and then I type up those lines and I cut them into strips of paper and I arrange them. I've written whole poems like this. Um, so, you know, it's being guided by my ear over and over again and, and voice and the assembly of it isn't arbitrary, but it is trying to see it differently and sometimes just creating a different point of entry into what I have written is necessary for me to hear and see it differently. Lovely. That's one of my favorite revision activities too, is, is pulling everything apart and doing mm -hmm. it all again, based mm -hmm. on what's, what sounds the best, what I'm most satisfied with in the poem and then starting again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, so what reading suggestions do you have? What sort of authors do you keep in your back pocket? Um, it, you know, it so depends, right? I mean, I, I'm always reading, um, partly because I'm always trying to read new things to teach, but I often go back, honestly, to the poems that I first loved and in terms of what gives me the most pleasure. And I think it's kind of like music. So before I give you a list, because I hate the list, I'm going to give you a, <laughs> an answer that's more about why I go back to the poems I do. Um, 
I think it's how I first appreciated music. What music does for me is it transports me in time. It is time travel. Memory is time travel. It's the closest I can come. Um, and I love the past. And so in order to relive in it, I'm looking for ways to go back. And I think poems that I first loved when I was becoming a poet in some way remain the most enduring for me. What they were teaching me and that excitement I had, I go back to reread them to refeel that again, to re-experience it. This is a limitation that I try to push against because it would mean that I would pretty much have stopped my reading by about, I'd say, mid-twenties if I did that, right? And guess what? The tradition of poetry, if I never read a book published before, like I'm talking about before I published a book of poems, right? When I was becoming a poet in a sense of being conscious of that as a craft I was entering into, a tradition. Um, that would mean that I would be limited to those books. Of course, those books are huge and vast. And I can tell you right now, if I only ever read The House on Marshland by Louise Glick over and over again, and The Book of Light by Lucille Clifton, um, and you know, a handful of poems by Stevens, Keats, um, and Yehuda Amachai or Agasha Hirali. I'm naming some of the poets I've that really, when I was first reading, between the British canon that I was exposed to and then also American canon, but then international poets, it would be enough. It would be enough. I'd have so much. So I, I trust that. At the same time, I make myself read, you know, a new book almost a week if I can by poets writing after that so that I can continue to hear what the language is doing. Poetry is a living art. It's not dead. And so I have an obligation to continue to hear how the poem is being changed by contemporary practitioners. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, um, my pleasure. It's great to talk with you about poetry anytime. We do this all the while, but now to get to do it in this format is great. Awesome. And, and thank you so much for your time. I've learned so much from our conversation, not just this one, but our conversations that we've had over the years. And um, I'm grateful for you taking the time to be here and to hang out with me. I've had the best time. Same. Thank you, Andy. It's good <laughs> to see you. I hope one day we're not going to do this not via camera, you know, and Zoom. But maybe this is what, in a weird way, engendered this idea for this very cool series that you're starting. And I'm really honored to be um, your first guest on your series. Yep.